Hello and a very good day to one and all. I hope you all are doing good and are safe back home. Thank you so much for having us today and we are delighted to be here to give you an overview about how to detect and respond to ransomware and web application attacks. Off late, we are getting to hear about cyber attacks happening across various organizations spread across various industries. Since most of the threat actors feel this is the right time to target their potential target, as any initial cyber attacks would sometimes go unseen. And we being a responsible global payment security specialist, it is our duty to assist organizations across the globe to help them being secure. We highly appreciate everyone for taking out your valuable time from your busy schedule and joining us from the various parts of the globe. To quickly introduce myself, my name is Mukesh and I work as a business manager with CISA and I would be the moderator for the day. Talking about CISA, CISA is a payment security specialist and a forensic investigation investigator having its reach globally. We also are a member of GEAR, which is a global executive SSR roundtable. Now, please allow me to welcome a speaker for the day. We got Renju Varghese. Renju is a Vice President Delivery at CISA. Talking about Renju, he's an authorized QSA and has handled several information system audits at leading banks, third party processors, IT, BPOs, airlines, and payment gateways. Being one of the core payment forensic investigators, Renju has been one of the lead investigators for large payment data breaches. In addition to that, Renju has also been a speaker or a key speaker in multiple forums. Quick housekeeping for the day. Today's webinar would last for 60 minutes, which would include question and answer session for five minutes each during the webinar. Please submit your questions that arise during the webinar through the Q&A section, which is located right below your screens. All the attendees would be muted automatically to enable the speaker to present without interruption. And last but not the least, this webinar will be recorded and uploaded in the webinar section of CISA and on our YouTube page. Now I would like to invite Renju to take over the session. Sure. Uh, thanks, Mugesh. Uh, thanks for uh, the introduction part of it. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending the uh, webinar on uh, the incident uh, playbook for uh, web app attacks and uh, ransomware attacks. Um, a quick walk through the agenda. Uh, we'll be uh, basically talking about the uh, recent breaches uh, that's happening across the globe right now. Oh um, man, overview. Uh, then we'll be uh, talking about um, the web app attacks and uh, what we can do as part of a incident response uh, playbook for the web app attacks. Uh, what uh, how to detect and uh, what steps to be taken once a uh, web app attack has been detected. Uh, then there's uh, definitely the Q and A session. Uh, my colleague uh, Kaushik will be moderating the. Uh, Q and A session, and then we have uh, uh, points with respect to the ransomware on uh, basically detecting a ransomware and uh, what should be your uh, our playbook if there has been a ransomware attack within your organization, and then the uh, final Q and A session, which will be moderated by uh, Kaushik. So to get uh, kick started. Uh, I think uh, all of you uh, will be aware about uh, the uh, about the intruders or the uh, malicious guys uh, capitalizing over the COVID-19 situation. Um, I think uh, on Monday, Microsoft has uh, released a new advisory stating that uh, there are quite a lot of uh, um, new domains being created um, related to uh, COVID-19 and uh, most of these uh, malwares are being published through various uh, Excel forms. So 
that's one advice that has been given by uh, uh, by Microsoft uh, just two days back. Uh, so apart from uh, various uh, phishing attempts that is uh, happening, uh, uh, the attackers are now actually targeting the uh, work from home uh, endpoint systems. Now, as the entire uh, world has uh, is working from home. Um, these endpoints are vulnerable as they don't have the network layer of securities that uh, as a organization that we have implemented. The researchers have shown that there has been a huge spike in the phishing emails uh, across the globe uh, uh, since the end of Jan 2020 and uh, most of this phishing uh, has been related to uh, COVID-19 uh, situations as well. Uh, situation basically. Oh, we ha also have observing a, a different trend uh, as, as part of our IFI activities, that is, uh, internal forensic activities, is that uh, there has been a spike in the uh, uh, corporate network uh, across the industry. One of the main reasons that we have observed, as uh, most of the organization has been from work from home to work from home scenario, they have also opened up most of their uh, corporate network to the outside world. Say, for example, your uh, human resource uh, management system, which earlier was uh, hosted within the environment, now has been opened to the uh, public so that employees across can access. Uh, then, then lot of your intranet uh, applications like your time management um, your intranet uh, site everything which earlier was hosted internally now has been exposed out so that most of the employees can definitely uh, make use of those uh, applications so um, earlier we only had uh, your basic uh, main applications um, that which has been basically uh, securely tested and uh, deployed behind the web being exposed out. Uh, in the recent uh, two months, we also have your less business critical applications being exposed out. Now, these applications definitely doesn't have that much kind of security being implemented as uh, who, who goes and do uh, web application audits on uh, your HRMS application, for example. So this has related to quite a lot of uh, uh, breaches, uh, which has actually gone unnoticed till uh, the intruders uh, or some of our uh, client network has been actually been uh, compromised by ransomware. Um, so just to have a very high level of the recent breaches. Uh, so most of the recent breaches just happened uh, is before the uh, lockdown period and um, we are sure that during the lockdown there has been quite a lot of huge number of breaches because the work from home sc uh, scenario uh, less monitoring by the uh, security folks uh, part of it but these are just uh, recent breaches which has been in the public domain before the lockdown period uh, definitely we have the uh, marriott uh, were around 5.2 million uh, pi data has been exposed out and uh, we believe that uh, the travel and tourism industry is the most uh, affected industry, not only economically, but also from a security standpoint uh, uh, during this lockdown period. Uh, we do have one client, uh, which is in the uh, hospitality industry, uh, where uh, the client has said that uh, to discontinue our uh, soft monitoring, but as a value add, we just continued the soft monitoring uh, irrespective of that. And we have observed that the attacks has increased exponentially high uh, during the last two months uh, because uh, most of the uh, intruders uh, or the uh, bad guys do know that uh, in the travel industry there is definitely less monitoring that is happening currently because uh, the security is one of the first things which has been uh, cut off as part of the layoff so most of these systems are being vulnerable right now um, then definitely there is the uh, uh, biggest uh, questions about the ransomware uh, which are uh, happening uh, and these days the uh, ransomware attacks has increased exponentially uh, high and they're targeting the corporate network. 
So this being the cognizant uh, maze ransomware, uh, we have uh, the latest uh, rebuild uh, ransomware, which uh, we just did an IFI investigation upon. Then definitely the uh, hospitality, uh, hospitals and healthcare industry, which has been affected. Uh, uh, and I'm sure that will be uh, hearing part of the uh, various uh, news where phishing and the targeted attack is been prominent. Um, we are also observing a huge number of uh, phishing uh, part of it, uh, not just to the uh, corporate domain, but to the uh, personal domain as uh, during the uh, work from home scenario, most of these users are able to access their Gmail accounts, which otherwise could have been blocked through your proxies and uh, has enabled uh, be, them being getting uh, fished uh, regularly uh, part of it. So we'll cover that uh, in the ransomware part of it slides. Um, also we have uh, not only payment data, we do have other data like uh, SpyZ uh, being exposed uh, in the month of uh, Jan. And uh, we also have our uh, CISA top five uh, forensics learning, which uh, is in the lines of Verizon um, uh, brief uh, breach incident report. But uh, basically, uh, um, this is a top five learning that basically talks about uh, the investigations that we have covered and what are the top five uh, learnings that we can do for improving the security of the organization. So as part of our forensics, uh, we do have observing quite a lot of data breaches. And uh, in the recent two months, uh, we have at least uh, five uh, PFI investigations that uh, the uh, payment brands has asked to uh, initiate. But unfortunately, uh, due to lockdown, the client is not able to provide us the support to initiate uh, those uh, PFI investigations. So the breaches have since stopped. These breaches are still continuing. and uh, as part of our IFI monitoring and PFI, we are observing a, a surge in the uh, breach part of it. As most of the cases hasn't been confirmed, I cannot give a number, but definitely there has been a surge in the past two months. Uh, now, having said that, uh, one of the major two attacks that we are observing uh, these days are basically a attack on the web app. Um, as most of your uh, uh, web applications has been exposed to the internet. And the second uh, prominent attack we are observing is definitely the ransomware attack uh, part of it. Now, to get this started, uh, let's uh, focus on the web app first. Now, in a typical web app attack, uh, definitely, uh, as you can see, this is a, just a very high level uh, network diagram uh, uh, of a bank that we are just uh, show, showcasing here where we do have the uh, DMZ zone, uh, which is the uh, demilitarized zone where you're going to deploy your uh, web applications. And uh, uh, web applications, and you do have uh, uh, your uh, support service segment where you're going to deploy your uh, critical server, support servers like your antivirus, backup servers, etc. And definitely you have your uh, uh, secure segment. Here we put a PCA segment, uh, which is might be behind uh, two or three firewalls for protecting your network. Now, what we have observing is uh, in your uh, DMZ, you basically uh, are deploying your uh, uh, corporate uh, systems, uh, sorry, your uh, main applications. But these days, what we have observed is that uh, um, due to the work from scenarios, the client has also deployed uh, um, any web interface applications in your uh, uh, demilitarized zone as well. Now, when you're going to do that, definitely there's going to be a vulnerable web server uh, uh, web servers which might be uh, getting deployed. So, from a hacker perspective, definitely they just uh, uh, if there's a vulnerability, then definitely they can uh, and be publicly accessible. Definitely they can. Uh, attack the same and uh, maybe deploy a backdoor or uh, take the entire database down everything but just consider if it's a timesheet application that you are hosted uh, in your dmz and it has been uh, uh, exploited but from an intruder perspective how much he can get it from a uh, timesheet you may just just get your employee details you make they get their employees phone number email id etc but not that much crucial data 
and even if they're going to encrypt your timesheet application, uh, you just basically going to uh, format it and just uh, going to restore it from your backup tape. So there's not going to be much uh, advantage which uh, the hacker do get from this application or from uh, exploiting just your timesheet application. So definitely they do a lateral movement where they just try to identify, uh, uh, get the credentials, uh, try to identify which other systems there's been getting connected and do a lateral movement or maybe basic say to a central server. What you observed is uh, definitely there are some central servers uh, like your uh, antivirus, your backup, um, your IT administrators, etc., um, which can be accessed across the environment. That is either from a DMZ or from your secure network. Um, in around 10% uh, of our attacks, what we observed is the, uh, the backup uh, server as one of the uh, easily compromisable server because uh, definitely there is a SSH or a uh, NetBIOS connection given back to a backup server for definitely taking the backup uh, uh, solutions. But apart from backup, there are multiple other uh, central servers which do have both connections from uh, to your DMC as well as your secure network. So when I say central server, it can be a central team like your uh, server administrator, your uh, network administrator, which may have access to both the uh, infra. So this central server can be also a central desktop or a uh, laptop, uh, which your IT administrator uses. Now, from an attacker perspective, definitely uh, from this vulnerable web server by deploying a web shell or something, they access the central servers. And from there, uh, uh, just because uh, once they're able to access, definitely they can able to get the credentials by using uh, various uh, 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 password cracking tools or any key loggers, they definitely do get the credentials and from which they can just do an uh, SSH uh, uh, to your uh, critical servers like say for example an ATM switch server in your bank environment and then definitely do any activities which they require to do. So it might be uh, as filtrating the your card numbers, it might be uh, deploying a ransomware for encrypting your ATM switch Etc. Et part of it. Now, what happens if uh, in this ATM switch, it's your in some ATM switch, core banking, and they just went ahead and uh, encrypted your both your core banking database? Uh, definitely, uh, you would uh, pay up the uh, ransom whichever mm -hmm. the uh, attacker uh, asks for. So, this is just a pattern I just um, explained, uh, basically from the web attack scenario uh, perspective. Um, this is um, one second. Uh, this is basically a, uh, um, a shell uh, which is being deployed uh, um, across the organization. So this is a uh, actual uh, PH web shell that we have able to retrieve uh, in our one of, from one of our investigation, which uh, basically through a uh, web interface, uh, I'm able to. Uh, uh, get complete uh, uh, access uh, and I can enter any of the commands which uh, uh, I want. Um, so I can just able to enter any commands uh, similar to a command prompt. Oh. Uh, if I choose a director, I can get the entire directory. So just to give a quick example on how it can be uh, exploited. Now, definitely, the uh, questions or points which you're going to mention. Uh, which most of our clients do come back stating that, hey, I do have my uh, web application firewall being deployed, which will prevent the attack. Yes, definitely, uh, we do have observed that uh, the web application firewall has been deployed. But one of the most uh, uh, interesting thing that we have observed is that uh, the, web, uh, the web application firewalls hasn't been configured for blocking uh, any attacks. They could have been just configured for the attacks to as a pass-through uh, method. Um, so even though your application firewall will detect a particular uh, attack, it doesn't drop that particular packet. It just allows the packet to uh, go through. The next question they mentioned, uh, our clients do mention, is that uh, we have to carry out application pen test. 
Um, so one of the reasons that we observed is uh, yes, uh, definitely we do carry out a detailed uh, application pen test, but most of the testing has been carried out on the testing environment. And we do have quite a lot of scenarios where uh, once the uh, testing has been passed in test environment, that fixes doesn't hasn't moved to the production environment. And uh, in the recent two months, what we have observed is uh, attack on your uh, non-critical application, like your HRMS timesheet, uh, etc. application, which definitely doesn't has undergone any application uh, pen testing uh, practice. And uh, other thing is definitely as part of the testing, we do carry out this DLC. But uh, uh, one of the PFA investigation that we did um, around uh, one year back, um, so almost nine months back, oh, what they have done, they have to follow the secure DLC. But unfortunately, there was a library which was vulnerable to SQL injection, and they just continued using that same uh, uh, code base across and uh, they didn't. Because it was developed uh, much earlier, uh, they didn't do any secure code review or testing on that uh, specific uh, module. So they just continued reusing the same, which actually led to uh, an SQL injection uh, 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 exploit to been happening. So definitely what we are stating is that uh, these, these controls are definitely required uh, for it to secure an environment, but um, it is. Uh, it doesn't completely give you 100% uh, uh, security uh, perspective. So, what uh, in for any uh, incident response uh, part of it, the first uh, the first action to be taken is definitely the detection part of it. Because unless you detect there has been a attack has happened on your environment, you don't know how to contain or how to prevent this thing, right? And when, when I say detection, you have to detect that attack from your internal team. You don't want any of your clients or any of your uh, uh, third parties or restaurant agencies like uh, payment brands coming to you and mentioning that, hey, your environment has been breached. It's definitely important to identify that there has been an attack and you need to uh, detect that attack within your organization. So as part of the incidents playbook, uh, response playbook, one of the first step is detection. Now, how to detect web server logs of a web app attack? Uh, the point you will be mentioning is that uh, won't my web application firewall uh, detect it? Yes, definitely it's going to detect. But what you observed is that if you have uh, 10 applications, most of the client uh, don't route all those 10 applications through the path. They only uh, route their critical applications to the path. And our point is uh, that web attacks has been uh, observed not only critical application, but on those applications which you actually ignore, like your HRMS part of it in the recent two months. So what we are stating is, uh, can you detect it from a web server logs? Uh, because that is one of the easiest methods for detecting it and uh, for detecting any web app attack. Now, the question that you will be definitely asking is, uh, do you have the expertise for detecting an attack from the web server logs? So I'm just going to give you a quick uh, a demo on how you can detect a web app uh, attack. Um, so let me just... Uh, So what we have done is that we have just uh, taken uh, a few of the uh, data set, uh, basically uh, uh, web server log part of it, which basically uh, from the basic raw log, uh, we just exported that into an uh, Excel sheet uh, for a quick uh, reference uh, part of it. Because um, if you open your uh, access uh, log, your Apache access log or your uh, web sphere, uh, access logs, it will be in a test format. And uh, from test, uh, definitely you need to convert it into an Excel, which I'm sure that there are a lot of tools which can uh, does the same uh, part of it. So this is basically a, uh, a converted uh, from the test into Excel uh, log uh, sheet. 
we have the IP address uh, like I've shown here. We have the date and time. Uh, we have the time zone. Uh, we have the HTTP method, uh, whether it's a get request or a post request. Uh, we do have the request response that is uh, whether uh, which uh, URL they have been accessing. Uh, you have the uh, uh, HTTP uh, protocol and definitely whether uh, status for whether it is uh, 200, uh, 404, etc. Now, what we are going to do is basically uh, just uh, copy the same content to another uh, sheet called the URL count and created a new column called URL character count. Okay. Now, in this URL character count, uh, it's just basically a small formula which is called uh, calculate the uh, length. That is how many characters are there in your specific request. Uh, which is very very uh, simple for you just put length you will get that particular uh, formula here so you identify that okay there is uh, this gives me the url uh, character count uh, part of it now why this character count uh, is uh, really interesting because if there has been any attack that is happening like for example if you see this particular uh, request this basically says that uh, the uh, user tried accessing index.html so it's a basic, uh, regular, uh, genuine uh, request. Okay, and its maximum character count is like 11 characters. But in an actual web app attack, the number of character counts will increase drastically, will be more than 60 or 80 characters. So using a simple length formula for calculating the number of characters in your uh, request or response, you will able to identify uh, the web app attack part of it. Now, uh, just to showcase here, we do have, say, something called 179 request, a character count. But please note that it's a post method. Because in a usual post, it's like you submitting a form or you giving your uh, your credentials. So in most cases, the post request uh, do have more than uh, 40 characters. So uh, more than 80 characters, definitely. So what we'll do is that we'll just uh, filter out and only have the get request sorted. So I do have my only my get request and I have my URL character count. Now what I'll do is just I'll just do a descending method. Now when I do a descending method, I identified that uh, the number of characters, which is definitely the highest gets identified here, right? Uh, so this is basically the request which has been uh, happening. Now if you see this particular request, uh, it is basically a URL encoded request and uh, in one shot, you may not understand uh, what it means, right? So we can just uh, copy this specific request and use uh, uh, URL uh, decoding uh, uh, tools. So you can just Google, you'll find uh, URL decoder. Um, it basically, what it does is it just uh, decodes your uh, URL request and gives you a more readable format. Now, if you actually see here, you identify that, hey, uh, that particular user has accessed uh, tomcat.jsp, which is basically a uh, uh, JSP file, and uh, basically has downloaded a uh, file from the specific folder called .ar. Now, which is definitely a, a specific uh, uh, malicious thing, but from a regular uh, viewpoint, you may not understand. You may just believe that hey, it can be genuine. Uh, so, so, what we can do, we can again go back and uh, check uh, more details. So, here we have another file. So, again, we can go, we can just uh, decode, which basically now showing that they are using the command directory. They're for accessing this particular uh, part, right? You can see the their part of it, which basically says that this tomcat.jsp is a web shell and they had basically done a directory uh, search on, which is sure that this is definitely a malicious uh, content. Again, if you want, you can just uh, go, uh, go in detail till, uh, because here all the uh, web shells are, uh, the number of characters is greater than 80, 
you can just uh, review it and you'll identify that most of these uh, attacks is basically a compromise and uh, both tomcat and wb.jsp are uh, uh, a web shell which has been deployed by the uh, intruder and they're trying to uh, uh, download uh, various files so you may have to go more detail but what i want to showcase here is that this is a very easy method by just using your length uh, character you'll able to identify most of your web app attack is happening in your organization um, you can also definitely go and uh, check the IP address and identify that hey, this particular IP address has been accessing this file. You just copy the IP address and again go to uh, various uh, uh, thread uh, uh, thread application like we have IBM Expose. Uh, currently, I'm using uh, Alien Vault uh, Thread Crowd. I think the just uh, mention that it's in. Uh, using the word thread i just using it there's quite a lot of different urls which is available in the market which you can use now if you see here uh, in alien world uh, uh, they have mentioned that most of the users have voted have voted this uh, ip as malicious right so there is double confirmation from your side that uh, this is a actual web app attack that has happened within your organization Again, uh, uh, there's another uh, easy formula which you can identify is uh, uh, basically uh, identifying the unique uh, IPs that hit your uh, web server in that particular day and basically do a count if that is how many count it has been repeating. So from here, we do identify that uh, there has been uh, these three URL where uh, the number of hits to that uh, uh, application has been huge. So you can definitely uh, take this uh, IP address, uh, do a quick uh, filter search. Do a quick uh, filter search and you'll get to know, okay, this is a basic index.html. There is uh, not major uh, attack and uh, might be some uh, scripts are running to check whether uh, its validity has been running or not. So you can just uh, ignore uh, the same. And similarly, we'll identify uh, the other vulnerable IPs uh, that we have observed, which has most number of uh, hits. Because of a 593 or a 35 hits, uh, based on your uh, um, application, um, you'll be able to identify whether it's malicious or not. So this is a very uh, easy method uh, for detecting the uh, an attack. Uh, basically, we use this particular met uh, method for uh, solving any uh, web app. Uh, PFA cases and uh, our record time is we have solved uh, a case which contains one year set of logs within three hours because we just uh, used a few of these uh, filtering uh, technique identify those IP address just identify this tomcat.jsp just do a filtering search we have solved the entire case in span of three to four hours so if you're able to what I'm saying is that uh, using the same technique um, you don't need the Info Bar 7 monitoring team. If you just have your uh, team to just get this particular web server logs and do a similar uh, uh, command uh, query, you will be able to detect whether any of your application has been uh, attacked or if any application has a vulnerability which has been successfully exploited by an intruder. And very easy uh, method uh, uh, part of it. Now, in this one, there's quite a lot of knowledge that you can get. You can get uh, the basic uh, whether it has been deployed a, a web shell. So here, uh, Tomcat.jsp. This is basically a, a web shell which has been deployed. We have WB.jsp, which is also a web shell that's been deployed. You'll get quite a lot of uh, informations, and uh, you also identify that for this scenario, he has actually deployed another. Uh, Web, uh, web shell as well uh, here. So you get quite a lot of um, information which you can then take and uh, able to uh, go and uh, detect or delete that particular web shell from your uh, web servers. Um, so this is one of the uh, easiest method uh, for identifying the same. It, as I mentioned, uh, the 24 by 7 team is not required, but definitely uh, uh, you need to spend uh, one hour on a daily basis 
by your uh, infosec team or your monitoring team and you'll be able to detect it even if you don't have a web application firewall uh, part now once you detect what should be your next step definitely it's the containment and the recovery part of it um, so the first step is uh, like uh, everyone we mentioned that to block the intruder ip on the firewall but this is just to give by you a few minutes or maybe a few hours because uh, an intruder can change the ip in HTTP. it doesn't uh, matter uh, if you block it or uh, doesn't block it uh, but blocking definitely gives you uh, some time um, take backup of your web app uh, deployment and uh, remove the files that have been deployed by the intruder so if you can see here we can identify those uh, web shells and uh, definitely take, uh, can get it removed by your uh, can get it deleted but one point to note is uh, when you take a backup uh, what you're observed is uh, when the uh, administrators take a backup they definitely take complete backup and when they get restored they actually restore the malicious uh, web shell as well back into the system so once you take a backup you have to ensure that uh, in the backups as well the uh, any uh, web shells and everything has been uh, deleted uh, then um, again by reviewing your uh, the same logs the same method you will be able to identify the actual uh, uh, vulnerability which was exploited by the intruder and uh, you need to have plan for uh, patching it up it can be a misconfiguration it can be a, a skill ingestion any kind of an attack uh, can be there uh, definitely uh, configure uh, deploy a web application firewall because uh, most of the web these days do give you a very good level of protection uh, we do have both open source and commercial uh, webs uh, uh, there uh, we can definitely use anything and they do give you a very uh, good protection part of it but you have to ensure that all the web interface all the web requests goes through your web and not just your critical systems um, definitely as part of the uh, recovery part of it you have to do a timeline analysis that means uh, if you identify this particular attack you may have to go back and uh, check all the uh, six months log uh, or one year log to identify uh, what all other kind of attack that intruder has uh, performed uh, because in most cases uh, in when we come for investigation what we observe is that uh, the intruder could have exploited that system for more than nine months or uh, one year back and uh, it only gets identified after a period of six to eight months and the time we come it will be easily nine months or ten months uh, down um so if you're able to uh, so if it's just starting right now on this kind of a attack then definitely you need to uh, go and do a timeline analysis to identify uh, what has been uh, uh, what has been observed um then definitely uh, on your web server do a anti malware scan so that all the any of these backdoors can be uh, uh, identified and uh, definitely uh, ensure that you do a 24 pass seven monitoring of the web server uh, logs even uh, for the uh, 24 pass seven monitoring if it's uh, very uh, difficult uh, we do suggest uh, using uh, uh these web server logs and at least uh do it for uh, uh for one hour a day uh, which and using the same method you will be able to identify uh, any web attacks that is happening and this is last step is the most important one that if there are if you're observing there has been any lateral movement that is uh, uh using these using these uh web shells they have uh, uh, jumped to any other uh, system then definitely you need to do carry out a further uh, deep diving and analysis on the same now when you're going to create your instant response uh, playbook for your web attack one of the first thing you have to take sure is that you scan your network for identifying all your web interfaces because we don't unless you know uh, what to what are the you don't know what to protect right so in your instant playbook definitely scan first step is scan your network for identifying all the web interface second step is uh, ensure that uh, those web interfaces or the web servers are configured to capture the access logs uh, because uh, as the access logs do take uh, space also the administrators could not have enabled the same so we need to ensure that 
it's been enabled. Ensure the web server logs are pushed to your SIM solution so that you can monitor through a central location. Or you can definitely uh, push it through a syslog and uh, uh, use the uh, our old Excel uh, sheet for uh, uh, reviewing those logs and detecting an attack pattern. Ensure you that you have 24 bar and monitoring team. And even if you don't have a 24 bar and monitoring team, you need to ensure that at least every day uh, your team analyze these particular web server logs uh, using these particular uh, formulas to identify if there has been any uh, attacks. So once these uh, these above steps are in place, then definitely we can take the um, steps. Once you uh, steps for uh, detecting it, and once it detected. Once the attack has been detected, then definitely uh, uh, we can uh, take it for any, uh, we can definitely follow the containment measures uh, part of it. Sure. So, so right now uh, I will take any uh, question and answers for, uh, on the uh, incident playbook for web app attack. Um, there is a section called questions in your uh, section and uh, you can definitely uh, type in your questions and uh, my colleague uh, Kaushik will uh, moderate the same. Thanks a lot for that, Renju. Um, and based upon what we can understand from the past uh, couple of slides, uh, the way application attacks and how exactly lateral movement is so much, uh, you can say, prevalent in case of malware uh, is something which, which we should watch out for. And uh, as per the COVID-19 or let's say the pandemic, whatever is occurring, I believe that um, we are not getting a pass on cyber security at all during even these crisis situations at the end of the day, because I believe we are facing forces which are beyond our control and anticipation. Uh, it's a convoluted uh, threat landscape with different tactics, techniques, and procedures which uh, organizations, uh, let's say, have to be rather more proactive in nature rather than reactive uh, so as to tackle it. So uh, with that, uh, means till the time we are getting questions from the participants, uh, I had a few from, from myself, and uh, maybe you can shed some light on the same. Um, so uh firstly i would i mean of course our participants would also like to understand that uh, you you have been a core pfi and you have handled so many uh let's say breaches uh in the past let's say many years um so from that particular perspective do you think that these types of phishing attacks which we can see every now and then right now uh have been the primary cause of breaches in the past one year or so uh, it will be really great if you can uh, help us with some examples around that. Sure. So uh, we have observing uh, quite a lot of uh, phishing attacks. Uh, so just to give a very uh, number, uh, in the past one year, around uh, 85 to uh, 88 percentage of the investigations that we carry out, the ingress point, that is the initial intrusion point, has been a uh, phishing email. Uh, the reason being that uh, phishing is very uh, uh, easy is uh, you can definitely get uh, most of the user details available uh, over the net and uh, you can send well drafted uh, phishing emails which force the users to uh, click the link. Um, just to uh, identify as part of our red teaming, uh, we do have a uh, success ratio of 90%. So if as a red team, if we can do 90 percentage, then definitely from an individual perspective, their percentage definitely goes much, much higher. Sure. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for that. Uh, that that really helped our participants over here. Uh, just a follow-up question on the same. Uh, because the phishing attacks, or I say whatever is being happening, uh, I believe the, the major source at the back end has been the spam emails, if, if 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 I'm not mistaken. So and you and we can see as well that the spam emails have grown tremendously in the past couple of months, or let's say in the couple of years. Uh, which have affected, of course, the businesses across the world, across the domain. Uh, based upon your uh, expertise towards the forensics, 
what do you think are the majority of the malicious files which are uh, covered in these spam emails are they like uh, .exe or re redirection to a particular url macros malware's uh, anything what so, so what's your comment on that it's a good question so uh, what we have observed is uh, these days the uh, spam filters uh, have improved so uh, uh, any exe uh, is something which I haven't we haven't observed uh, for quite some time uh, definitely the words and excel are uh, being uh, is being increased uh, drastically url also we are observing this a uh, declining trend as uh, most of the spam filters do have the techniques to identify and uh, put it into junk folder what we are observing recently which is much more sophisticated and uh, much more critical to uh, uh, do is a PDF which is password protected. Now I can have a uh, uh, PDF been uh, uh, running, um, PDF been sent with the password protection, so that most of the spam is not able to open it up. And second, I do have the links within that particular PDF, so which forces the users to uh, click on that link. So it ensures that uh, the mail gets delivered uh, to the recipient. And uh, because what I observed uh, as part of our attack means investigation is a targeted targeted phishing email. Say for example, uh, say, say Kaushik, if I am, if you got an email say from uh, our CEO Darshan stating that uh, please open this particular file and uh, please review this particular uh, content and get back to me, uh, then definitely uh, it's uh, you will definitely open up that particular PDFs. Uh, uh, do a browsing to do research on what Darshan wants, right? So those kind of a targeted attack is something which you are observing on the investigations that we carried out. Definitely from the industry, there's quite a lot of other phishing attack, but from the successful uh, ingress done by the intruder, we are observing these kind of a sophisticated targeted uh, phishing attacks. God, Trenjo, that, that that really helps, and I believe that is the way reason why uh, I believe uh, from FireEye there was a particular uh, you can say an analysis where they said that okay, eighty six percent of uh, the email attacks are malwareless. Uh, that is what they what what these types of intruders are doing is uh, that they are coming up with malware laden messages. And then accordingly, uh, let's say the users are routed to some other command control center or some other website. And that is the way reason, uh, based upon the study again, that around 37.9% of untrained users fail phishing tests or let's say fail spam tests in the in, in majority of the cases. So I believe that that's very insightful from, from our end. Uh, I think we can proceed uh, with that if, if that's fine with you, thank you. Sure, we'll do that. So, uh, as we are discussing uh, the uh, attack patterns, uh, um, Kaushik, uh, I think um, this is the most important one that is the ransomware uh, attack. Now, uh, I'm sure that everyone does know what ransomware is. Uh, uh, so, it basically ensures that uh, uh, um, your data gets uh, encrypted. Now, um, as per the uh, cyber threat defense report, uh, what uh, uh, we are observing, which is the same line, is that uh, there has been an increase in the organization being affected by the ransomware. So, uh, earlier it was 56, now it's around 62.4. And what is the most important uh, uh, factor which is concerning is the number of organizations which has actually paid that particular ransom which has increased from 45 to around 57.5 percentage and organization uh, didn't pay ransom has actually decreased from 55 to around 42.3 uh, percentage part of it so what what it shows here is that uh, these days the attack done by the intruder for this ransomware is very very successful right they are able to able to encrypt your critical files uh, uh, so that which you are forced to pay a ransom to the uh, intruder 
gone are the days where uh, they just encrypt any of the files and say give me an answer no they're doing a very targeted attack and whichever files is a critical systems they're encrypting that so that they you so they ensure they ensure that you pay their ransom part of it oh so as you can see this is the uh, figures in uh, 2019 as for the crowd strike of uh, the uh, ransom paid has increased uh, good and is the uh, highest ransom paid that is around uh, 12.5 million us dollars so it's something which uh, everyone has to be uh, aware of and this is something which is in public domain i'm sure that there's quite a lot of other uh, ransomware attack which hasn't come into the public domain uh, which uh, we may not be aware on uh, how much has been the uh, total amount has been paid and uh, definitely based on the stats uh, as uh, we just discussed the uh, graphic uh, just uh, put across um, 91 percent of the cyber attacks do start with a phishing email especially for a ransomware attack they do a targeted attack now why this is really really important as in during these times of work from home scenarios this phishing attempt has increased drastically because uh, you don't have your network security controls protected uh, and second uh, most of the work from home users do have uh, connect, able to connect to other uh, email domains like gmail and everything their personal emails which can be targeted by the uh, intruder now for simple example if you just do a uh, my name so gentle work is plus linkedin plus uh, cisa you will get my personal email id you will get my official email id in one shot now if i have that details and doing a little bit of uh, quick two or three clicks you'll get to know who i am reporting to as well that information is definitely available over uh, linkedin and across the uh, domain which is being used by the uh, intruders uh give an example uh, in CISA, every week uh, we are getting uh, phishing attacks which are detecting. Now, these days it's coming even more uh, complex attacks. And the good news or uh, the bad news from our perspective is uh, the intruders are targeting those guys whom they know are not that uh, tech savvy. For example, they're targeting or the phishing emails are in such, drafted in such a manner that uh it's from uh, darshan uh, with uh, darshan's photo and everything uh and sending to a finance uh, person saying that hey uh and um, can you please uh, make this payment so it's much much targeted now getting the photo and everything is very easy there's a lot of tools uh, which we also do as part of our teaming activity and uh, we can write very convincing emails which uh the uh, the receiver is forced to uh, click so that's some pattern that we are observed. Now, uh, typical uh, steps of a ransomware attack, uh, definitely the attacker sends a phishing email. Um, the user receives the links and clicks on it. Now, once the uh, user clicks on it, uh, uh, definitely uh, the malware gets unpacked and gets executed. So that first malware will not be your uh, ransomware. Uh, it will be just a backdoor that will be uh, created and that particular backdoor which is in the system will definitely going to uh, communicate to a uh, command and control uh, system uh, which is a cnc uh, common, uh, command and control uh, server which definitely uh, downloads uh, the public key which can be used for encrypting the same now in this particular scenarios uh, what we have observed is uh, uh, this the system which the user uh, that first malware gets uh, unpacked will not be your uh, any system which gets encrypted uh, definitely using the same technique which i mentioned uh, earlier definitely the intruder could have done lateral movement identify the most critical system in your environment and go and encrypt the same so once the file gets encrypted then definitely uh, user communication happens for uh, the uh, key delivery and uh, bitcoin uh, part of it so as I mentioned, uh, it can, uh, we just mentioned phishing email, it can be of any attempt, like uh, even the, uh, the web shell that we had discussed earlier can be used for uh, 
delivering the same. It need not be uh, just a phishing uh, attack pattern uh, per se. And uh, these uh, initial system can be just the ingress system and not the uh, targeted system which the user is going, the intro is going to go and uh, encrypt. Um, so what are the uh, incident response steps that can be taken? Uh, first is definitely the uh, basic uh, you know, preventive methods uh, which we can have is uh, a monthly patching of the servers. Uh, that's definitely required because uh, uh, the Windows malware do uh, exploit the vulnerabilities present in the application. Now the applications can be your uh, uh, Adobe's can be your uh, Java can be anything. One of the most important uh, point that we actually mention is the weekly patching of your uh, endpoints. That's your uh, uh, laptops and the desktops part of it. Why say weekly? Because uh, uh, definitely every week, both Microsoft and Adobe do release uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, backup. Uh, sorry, uh, quite a lot of uh, patches to be built. A patch up um, then ensure that we have a daily backup and uh, ensure that uh, we have the endpoint uh, solutions being uh, deployed as well so one of the critical steps which uh, uh, some of our clients has came back and asked is that uh, we do have quite a lot of our uh, critical uh, laptops and systems being uh, deployed in a work from home scenario. So, and I don't have the enough budget to deploy a uh, EDR kind of a solution. Uh, uh, I do have basic and uh, antivirus, but I don't have the latest, uh, uh, say, AI based antivirus which can prevent it. So, how will I know whether that system is secure? Because I do have quite a lot of my senior managements being uh, uh, running in work from home scenario. Uh, one of the again the easiest method uh, which can easily identify a backdoor communication is uh, do ask your uh, 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 your users to just use our old netstat. So it just you can just open up the uh, command prompt uh, in your uh, system or a terminal if you're using a Mac and just run the command netstat. What NetStat does, it basically going to uh, identify what has been the communication which has been going out from your system to the uh, internet. Now, as you can see here, we have the local address uh, system and we do have the, uh, uh, the foreign address or the URL part of it. So it gives you this complete uh, data set. Now you can ask your uh, users just to copy this data and uh, uh, share it with you with your uh, infosec team, so they can do it for their analysis part of it. So from a user perspective, they just need to run this next step, just copy this data and uh, send it across to you. Now from your infosec team, once you get this data, what you have to do is basically uh, check for those external IP addresses. So in this case. Uh, so in this case, we have an external IP address 52.16. You can then exfiltrate this particular data onto your SIM solution and use your various thread feed which is available. If not, you don't have a thread feed like IBMX Force or Alien Vault or TX. There's multiple. For us, we use around 45 to 46 thread feeds, both paid and open source. And you can just uh, do a quick search in this thread feed part of it. So here I'm again using uh, the Alien Vault uh, thread crowd. As I mentioned, we are not uh, promoting it. We're just uh, using for demo purpose, which basically uh, shows me, okay, uh, for this particular IP address, uh, it's basically a uh, Amazon IP. So this may not be uh, wonderful. It's perfectly fine. Now, what I'm showing casing here is basically a uh, another uh, attack pattern uh, so this again a uh, an attack uh, result uh, for like system has been compromised for our demo purpose and i can see here okay there is another ip called 52.34 so let me just enter that particular ip and 
it shows me that uh, it shows me that again this system is basically a uh, amazon and cloud and belongs to uh, microsoft uh, so this can again be ignored for positive i see another ip called 37.1.216 so again enter the same and uh, I can identify that hey, this IP is sorted as malicious, and these are the various other domains which it belongs to. What gives me uh, details is that then definitely this particular uh, system has been compromised and do have a backdoor which has been deployed. Why a backdoor? Because most of the malware which has been deployed in a uh, system will definitely try to communicate to a command and control uh, server over port 80 or 443 because if that particular uh, laptop is in a corporate network then they cannot just uh, mention uh, the IP address and go right they will be routing the traffic uh, through your DNS server and out so just using this net stack and just as filtrating getting those uh, external IP address and running a thread uh, feed search it's a very quick, easy method for you can identify whether that system has been compromised or not. Once it's been uh, it has been compromised, then you can definitely ask them to uh, use various uh, instant response tools like uh, fast IR or CISA IR for identifying whether uh, uh, getting more details. So what I'm just showing here is basically a, uh, a fast IR result, uh, which is basically nothing a uh, uh, Python script which uh, gives you more details about uh, what is running in that particular system. So I have my RP tables, uh, what is the process that's been opened, uh, what are the process uh, list, uh, all the details comes which we can definitely go to use and uh, use it for a detailed analysis. Uh, sorry, just stopping that. So basically gives me what all process been running, which is the locations, all this information is coming in the picture. So we are not uh, going into detail to this because this requires a total uh, different uh, section. But what I'm saying is that from a just basic uh, net stack uh, command, and if you can get this data for all your work from home systems, using again a sim something simple uh, technique, you'll able to identify which all systems has a backdoor been deployed and accordingly take uh, necessary precautions. The same technique can be uh, used for your uh, uh, servers, your uh, everything, so that uh, you will be able to get this information in much quicker shot. Um, so the reason why I'm stating that stat is really important because in the work from home scenario, you currently don't have any centralized uh, tools uh, which you can able to do it. Uh, there are centralized tools like uh, Google Rapid Response uh, and uh, uh, Velocious Raptor uh, Rapid Response tool, which basically uh, can do kind of this fast IR result uh, remotely, but it requires you to install agents and everything, which is going to again uh, be a cumbersome process. But just asking them to give the net stack, you will get that this information. Uh, why uh, NetSet is uh, powerful uh, is because if that system has a backdoor uh, running, then most of the backdoors that we observed will give a ping request. That is, uh, we just ping to the uh, command and control server stating that, hey, uh, uh, I'm available. Do you want to uh, uh, run that exploit and or able to take control per se? So this keeps on sending that particular ping request back to a command and control server which you can use it for detecting the same. So this is something which you can use in your current uh, work from home scenarios and uh, ensure that uh, your senior management and your uh, critical systems uh, systems are uh, uh, detected. So uh, like I mentioned, uh, we do have uh, the deployments of backdoor like the uh, steps for command and control uh, once been communicated once been uh, deployed then definitely the backdoors do communicate to the command and control uh, server or do a secure key exchange a uh, part of it now after that um, they definitely uh, once a key has been exchanged and uh, once intruder uh, knows the 
critical systems they're definitely going to start encrypt the files and uh, then definitely for exploitation of data in, in the recent ransom pairs uh, they're also exfiltrated data as well apart from encrypted data as well so what we're stating is, is uh, if you're able to uh, detect a particular uh, communication uh, a ransomware communication uh, been getting established you will be able to prevent it now if you're not able to detect then and you only getting detected only get detected once the ransomware encrypts your files then your uh, question is either you pay up the ransomware or uh, uh you uh, just ignore uh, the data and just delete the data part of it so here detection is most uh, critical here uh, component uh, per se now once you how to identify definitely uh, uh, in your endpoints you can use uh, manual methods like the uh, netstat commands and the fast iron which i've mentioned uh, we also have uh, open source uh, tool called CISIA, which can give that kind of a output. Oh, at the network level, definitely you need to ensure that you capture your DNS server log, your NetFlow logs, as well as your proxy server logs, so that uh, you'll be able to identify all these uh, communications. Um, definitely DNS server, NetFlow, and uh, proxy server, the, number, the log size will be huge. So, you, uh, and as per any of the compliance requirement, you don't need to store these logs for a period of uh, one year. You don't need it so even if you store it for a period of uh, three to seven days that is fine but capturing these logs is uh, a very crucial as uh, you can get quite a lot of you're able to detect quite a lot of these information from these logs your next generation firewalls do use these techniques to identify if there is a uh, uh, back-end communication but if you don't have a, a next generation firewall then uh, ensuring that you capture these uh, logs will uh, give you that uh, input with respect to endpoint devices definitely we have mdr and edr solutions uh, so the logs are the same uh, your antivirus uh, uh, will not may not be able to detect uh, the attacks because um, uh, as part of my uh, experience as a forensic investigator uh, we have observed uh, is that uh, antivirus uh, doesn't give you that much uh, protection it's just more for a uh, it do give but uh, these days the intruder are very smart and uh, they definitely launch uh, malware which your antivirus is not able to detect its normal part of scans um, so that's what you observe but if you have an edr uh, definitely uh, because edr and mdrs uh, do monitor your uh, packets uh, at a packet level do more monitor your packet uh, capture level and then uh, detect these kind of uh, detection uh, per se or definitely using the manual methods you can uh, identify now once you identify the systems uh, is been affected then definitely uh, first step is remove and uh, the suspicious system from the network now it is a uh, 24 uh, sorry it's a uh, catch in the situation because most of the malware that we have done reverse engineering uh, in the past uh, uh, two to three years uh, will get self destruct if there is no network connectivity. Right? So, uh, because most of the malware that you observed uh, doesn't have a, a persistence, like it's not in the file, it's basically it will be the memory part of it. And if uh, you plug it out of the network uh, and uh, if the malware detects that there is no network connectivity uh, then it will actually delete itself uh, and um, so when i what i say sketch situation is that uh, if you want to do any analysis on how the malware is behaving then you won't be able to uh, do the same so the best method is definitely uh, is able to block it at your network level uh, but in a work from home scenario there's nothing you can do you can just ensure that uh, once the uh, you can ask these uh, users to return the laptop and you can operate in a sandbox environment and uh, check it out what that malware does uh, definitely you block the uh, cnc ip that you are identified in a firewall but as again i said uh, these days the malware are uh, uh, very very uh, uh, sophisticated uh, it does definitely use something called as uh, 
uh, domain uh, generation algorithm so that it keeps on communicating to various domains. So even if you block uh, one IP, it's able to communicate to another IP in the next uh, next minute itself. So, but these are definitely uh, the steps which is by default we have to take. And we need to definitely run uh, the IR scripts like uh, for collecting the artifacts like fast IR and CIR, uh, which you can uh, able to identify uh, most of the attacks. And the most most crucial one is uh, to scope all the systems uh, uh, which have interacted with that particular uh, affected system. Um, so, because uh, uh, what I observed is the intruders not only just keep one uh, backdoor, they definitely do have multiple backdoors been deployed. So that even if you just stop or uh, able to delete one of the backdoors, they will have uh, other backdoors deployed in other systems uh, to uh, initiate that particular intrusion part of it. And uh, boot system in uh, uh, safe mode and uh, launch a deep scan. Uh, Hopefully, we'll be able to identify and um, ensure that you repeat the same steps above for all these scope systems that you have identified, uh, which has communicated to that particular uh, infected system. Uh, recovery uh, once it's been you've been uh, affected, then either you pay the ransomware or uh, uh, you format the system, ensure that you recover from your backups and installation points, uh, and if possible. Uh, we can try recovering uh, the encrypted data of using the data recovery softwares, but the uh, percentage of the success rate is uh, very, very, very low uh, per se. Uh, then, if the data is not uh, unrecoverable uh, and there is no backup, then it's up to the organization to pay the ransomware or not. So, here, uh, once that's what I mentioned, is that detection, the detection is most important because. Uh, once been um, uh, infected, then uh, uh, you don't have any other uh, option. So it's like our COVID-19, the prevention is uh, definitely better than the cure part of it. Uh, the incident response uh, playbook for ransomware, uh, we definitely need to ensure that the basic security controls like uh, securely configured firewall, your IDS IPS, uh, uh, your web app, uh, uh, your antivirus, anti malware solutions, uh, FIM, SIM, everything has been deployed. Uh, most important, you need to ensure that your uh, endpoint systems are patched on a uh, weekly basis as uh, as uh, most of the malware during the initial uh, uh, backdoor deployment do exploit those uh, ransomware, sorry, those uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, definitely, uh, your standard PCDS controls. Um, uh, can be implemented when I say standard PCDSS. Uh, the reason being that uh, uh, it is one of the best security standards across the globe. So uh, instead of focusing only on your payment related data, you can consider uh, PCI for across your organization part of it. And regular backup and the most crucial one, end user security awareness. Especially during these uh, work from home scenarios, your end user security awareness has definitely gone down, uh, which uh, we are observing across all our clients. Um, so uh, keeping on re-emphasizing, uh, ensuring that there's some at least a weekly uh, uh, security awareness is very very crucial. Reason being that, uh, please note, your endpoint, your end users doesn't have your network set of security controls to protect them. They are alone, and they're definitely going to use uh, big Wi-Fi's, common Wi-Fi's connected with other uh, systems. My, which might download uh, torrents, other applications, play games. So your endpoint systems are the most vulnerable right now. So you need to ensure that you do a uh, awareness on a regular basis. We recommend even a uh, weekly basis to ensure that uh, your endpoint systems are secured. Sure. Um, so. Uh, once basic controls is implemented, you can ensure that the logs are enabled and captured, like your DNS logs, NetFlow logs, web server logs, proxy and server logs. Uh, these logs are important to ensure that uh, you're able to detect that solution. Um, most of the SM solutions can uh, detect these kind of analysis on a real-time basis and generate alerts. Um, if not, then please do talk to your uh, solution providers to provide that kind of a solution. 
and ensure that you have at least uh, three or four uh, uh, thread feeds integrated, not just one thread feed, so that you'll be able to identify the same. Have 24 bar seven monitoring team. If not 24 bar seven, at least have uh, one team member who does the monitoring uh, these eight hours to ensure that uh, uh, these kind of attacks are identified. And do have a team uh, trained on uh, the incident response activity and ensure that you have the uh, steps uh, documented. So, so with that, uh, I'll just open the floor for questions. Thanks a lot, Ranju, for that. Uh, that has been really insightful. And um, I believe uh, phishing, ransomware, and all these types of attacks uh, are going to be a nightmare for uh, all the C-Devil executives for quite some time. Uh, so, so based upon the same, based upon the same uh, line of events, uh what do you think that the ransomware over here are here to stay or will they be gone in the next two or three uh years based upon the technological control enhancement and awareness training which which we are doing so ransomware will be uh here uh, till lifelong because uh, what the intruders want the intruders basically wants uh, to make money right and ransomware uh, is definitely much easier to monetize than any data breach because you get paid on immediate basis while in a data breach you have to take down the data or you need to sell it in the uh, dark web and get paid so ransomware is, is going to be there and is going to only increase uh, as we speak with much more uh, sophistication that's what we're currently seeing we are going to see uh, uh, ransomware uh, uh, we're going to see ransomware which actually has filtrates the data as well. So apart from your system being encrypted, uh, data breach is also going to be a play crucial role as well. Got it, Ranger. Uh, I believe that that is the case because uh, based upon the study, uh, around 1.7 plus billions of dollars uh, was actually resulted in losses based upon the business email compromises uh, in 2019 alone. Um, and uh, 3.5 million plus dollars was actually an average cost of a human error data breach in 2019. Whereas uh, victims paid more than 1.5 million plus dollars uh, in the first half of 2019 based upon these ransomware and the other kinds of attacks, which I believe is absolutely, as you rightly said, is here to stay. Uh, so. Uh, so on, on on the same line of events again, uh, we we discussed something about uh, uh, let's say a breach which happened with respect to the one of the biggest hospital uh, hospital the tycoon, uh, which raised many eyebrows towards security controls. That okay, what exactly is happening uh, on the other side of the fence? So what do you think over there? Are they implementing ample amount of security controls? Even then, the intruder is able to get access to it, or what exactly is happening over there? Sure, Koshik. Just can you repeat your question? I just uh, lost you. Sure. So uh, uh, the the biggest hospitality tycoon actually got compromised a few uh, months or let's say a few quarter back. Uh, yes. Although they were one of the biggest hospitality tycoon, it means they will be having top-notch security controls or security solutions at the end. But even then, they got compromised. So, what exactly do you think was the root cause behind that? Um, so, root cause maybe only once you've done a forensics, uh, we'll be able to identify the actual scenario. But uh, having said that, uh, um, based on my our set of investigation that we carry out, uh, even having all these controls may not be able to prevent it. Say, for example, uh, in the, one of the recent cases that we did, they have deployed the latest uh, EDR solution, right? Uh, and they said that hey, uh, you don't need to monitor those set of servers because uh, my EDR will protect it automatically, it will stop the attacks from happening. Now, when we start uh, analyzing the logs, what you're saying is saying is that even the EDR solutions is able to detect it, okay, but it has not quarantined or deleted that particular file. I'm just giving an example. Now, even if you, that, that's what I, what I mentioned, even if you deploy your uh, entire uh, investment in deploying the latest uh, set of tools and uh, doesn't do a 
monitoring or uh, reviewing of these logs, then these tools are of no use. Because these tools can only prevent 80% of the attacks, while the 20% of attacks uh, will definitely uh, be there. Because intruders are uh, really street smart guys, and their job is to ensure that they have intrusion which, which where they can bypass all the controls that you deploy. Whether it is a map, whether it is a uh, uh, EDS solution state, deploy these uh, uh, the intrusions. They they actually try to bypass all those uh, controls that you actually deploy part of it. So I'm not surprised that uh, big guys get so compromised uh, because uh, only why we get to know big guys is that they do have the disclosure agreement. Uh, I do believe that all the uh, medium and the uh, Small enterprises are do have compromised is either they haven't identified it or because there's no disclosure requirement, they are not disclosing the same. Got it, Ranger. Got it. So, uh, basically, as I can understand, that uh, let's say the MDR, the EDR solutions, and all those things that the, the next level of solutions will play a crucial role in protecting, let's say, our organizations at the end of the day. And uh, this is, uh, I think, about the uh, about the Gartner study. Uh, they, they came up with the four pillars for security, right? Like, they talked about prevention, detection, response, and prediction. And I believe today SOC operations and monitoring along with the MDR and the EDR solution are providing automated incident response. Uh, they're providing high fidelity threat intelligence feeds. Uh, they have an industry leading uh, reach back as well uh, at, at, at the back end. And of course, along with the forensics as well backed up. So I believe that is something which the organizations want, or let's say organizations need today so that they can be proactive uh, while uh, let's say thinking towards a risk rather than reactive in nature uh, because at the end of the day as all of us uh, you can say um, uh, you can say can say that uh, threat uh, today's threat is uh, tomorrow's risk so uh, absolutely that that is something which we should be sure so one of the questions which we have from one of the participants is that uh, can we get the CISA IR tool um all right so uh CISA IR tool absolutely uh that is something which is included in our package uh from the uh you can say uh, from a managed services solution uh so absolutely we'll be able to uh, you can say uh get you across to that um and uh, our sales team will be able to contact you with respect to same so we have noted this particular thing and uh, our sales team will be contacting you uh for the same and then accordingly we can take the particular thing ahead uh second question which we have is that uh, let's say which was the most sophisticated method of breach you have come across uh of course this would be better answered by Rainju, but i'll just take a shot and then of course i'll transfer it to to Rainju. i believe the most sophisticated method of breach with uh, cisa as a pfi had come across was where uh, the intruder was, uh, let's say, able to change or modify the HSM commands, and uh, accordingly, let's say, they were able to get the as the pin block encryption and decryption from the HSM itself as a part of the command. I guess that was one of the, uh, well, let's say, one of the tedious breaches with. Uh, but again, I will I will transfer this question to Rangeu because he had been the core PFI. So Rangeu, your your comments on this? Sure. So uh, so in any any breach, we have uh, three legs, right? That is the ingress, the egress, and the uh, end game. Uh, ingress is uh, where uh, uh, this is the first exploit that's happening. Then we have the lateral moment, and finally the end game where they have taken it up or taking either the data filtration part of it. Now the end game, uh, the one which uh, Kaushik mentioned, um, is for the uh, uh, the largest debit card breach that happened in India. I think uh, uh, four years back or three years back, uh, is the most sophisticated attack till that time, uh, because uh, it took us around uh, three to four months to solve that particular case. And uh, across the world, that is, uh, we saw certain everyone said that uh, they can't solve it, and uh, we solved the same. So it's much more sophisticated were the intruder was the system for around uh, two years studied uh, how the uh, HSM functions 
and they used their own HSM for decrypting and getting the uh, debit card uh, pay. So that was a much, much sophisticated uh, endpoint case. With respect to the intrusion, uh, we uh, will observe the major intrusion because what we observed is either it's a phishing attack, phishing email, uh, where they deployed a backdoor, or it is a web application vulnerability through which they have uh, entered and created a backdoor for it. So for the intrusion uh, system, uh, 99% or 99.99% or is only these two. The 0.01 uh, are the cases where we are not able to identify those uh, intrusion part of it. We haven't, uh, of all the investigations, which is more than uh, 300 plus uh, right now, we haven't identified a new type of uh, uh, intrusion sophisticated. Uh, we do have, uh, say, USB has been getting connected, uh, the users have been visiting uh, various sites, they're playing uh, uh, um, the games in their laptops through which the backdoors get downloaded, either torrents get downloaded. It's we have it observed where there is an actual uh, full fledged uh, breach of a latest vulnerability and uh, uh, taking control. So it's either either of these, uh, for the initial intrusion falls under these levels. While the end game do differ uh, drastically, part of it, and we have identified very sophisticated manners in which uh, uh, the intruders are able to take data out. One of the other uh, interesting uh, sophisticated manner is where. Uh, the intruder is able to take the particular data, zip it, convert that into a JPEG format, and replace the uh, website GPT uh, file. Um, so instead of when you go to website, instead of showing our workshop, uh, say photos, uh, it will show the uh, image of the uh, zipped and encrypted file, which they can just download and reverse the process and get the data out. So it's a sophisticated way of data filtration that we have identified. There are multiple uh, interesting things that we observed, but I think uh, we don't have the time to discuss uh, everything here. Sure, sure, Renjo. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, and one last question which we have is that uh, have we come across any of the breaches where the intruder was able to bypass the firewall? Uh, so absolutely, we have come across many such instances. Um, however, of course, we cannot disclose the names or the say we have uh, seen the case studies as well in which web application firewalls have been, uh, you can say, bypassed. Uh, that is something which is freely available over the internet as well. Uh, however, just to uh, give you guys an idea, uh, how it works is that basically you should have an analyzer in between which should understand that, okay, is there a WAF? In between or not, that's the first step. And secondly, it works entirely upon the WAF's response around it. And accordingly, organizations, or let's say intruders, have been able to bypass even the WAF as well at the end of the day uh, and successfully uh, intrude into any of the organizations which actually have got breached um, at the end. I think that was the last question which we had uh, from us. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, Ranjo, over to you. Sure. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thanks for attending our. Uh a webinar on uh, uh, incident response playbook for ransomware and uh, web app attacks. Uh, thank you all and uh, hope that uh, you do take the necessary uh, safety measures and uh, stay, stay at home. Also, please ensure that uh, you secure your uh, all your work from home systems as well with the methods that we mentioned and ensure you secure your family first and definitely secure your uh, network as well. Thank you team and uh, have a great day ahead.